and there's Facebook. What's up, y'all? Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. It is a cold one. Gonna have to decline that phone call. <laughs> Somebody gonna call when I'm trying to minister to the broadcast. But anyway, um, it's a cold one today here in Chicago. I don't know where you are, but I hope you are bundled up warm because it's a seriously, seriously cold one here. Okay, so let's jump right in. We'll start, as always, with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Just thank you for this day, thanking you for your grace in which we stand, O oh God. I ask you to breathe through me, O oh Lord. Use me, breathe through my mouth, my hands, my lips, my tongues. I surrender, Lord, that you might fill with the Holy Ghost, that you might have said what you once said, that you can breathe through me, O oh God, and bless your people to the glory and honor of your name. And we thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> All right. So. Today, I'm going to teach you a principle first, and then give you an example, and then we'll talk about uh, today's prophetic word. Today's prophetic word is actually, do we really know him? Okay? Do we really know him? That's the prophetic word. But I've got to teach you a principle and give you an example first, and then we'll come, come back to that word, okay, and break it down a little bit better. Uh, first thing I want to show you is the principle, and here's the principle, okay? Uh-oh. Here's the principle. <clears throat> God's Word is not based on feeling. It's based on fact. But you will never grow until you accept the Word of God emotionally. Okay, now I know that was a handful. Uh, let me uh, say that again. God's word is not based on feeling, but it's based on fact. However, you will never grow until you accept the word of God emotionally. Now, that is a part of what you hear me say all the time, because I'm always talking about HBO. We have to hear, believe, and obey. But to actually believe something, it, does just not, it doesn't just mean to give mental assent to it. It doesn't just mean to give mental consent to it or just let the words come out of your mouth it means that you actually accept it mentally and emotionally it's what you meditate on it's it's the dominant thought in your brain because you know as we all know we have many many thoughts that run through our brains and you have to make a decision every day where your focus is what you're going to focus on okay so when you know if you could have a recording of your self-talk what is your self-talk? What are you saying to yourself? Are you saying to yourself the same things that God is saying to you, either through the prophetic word or the written word? Is that what you meditate on mentally, but also emotionally? How do you feel? Do you feel like what God says about you is true, or are you just nodding your head saying, yes, amen? But that ain't how you really feel. When you look inside yourself and you see your self-image, and you have the idea of yourself, uh, is it what God says? Is Are you seeing the you that God says you are? Is that how you feel on the inside? Okay, that's very, very important. So once again, the principle is that God's word is not based on feeling. It's based on fact. However, if you're going to grow, you have to accept the word of God emotionally. Okay, and I've noticed that sometimes that has been glossed over. And that's why you have people walk around, they follow God, but they still have low self-esteem. Like the first generation that, uh, that came out of Egypt, of the children of Israel, when they came up to the promised land and they saw the giants after they spied it out, what did they say? They said that we are as grasshoppers in their sight. How did they know how the giants saw them? Giants could have been scared. A whole lot of people got scared of the Hebrews once they found out what the God of the Hebrews could do. <coughs> okay, excuse me. So, but they said, see, that was their low self-esteem coming out of their mouths. They said that we are as grasshoppers in their sight. That's how they saw themselves. Even after all that God had done for them, the ten plagues of Egypt, spoiling the Egyptians as they left, marching across the wilderness, manna from heaven, water from the rock, quail from the ocean, a uh, pillar of uh, fire, uh, excuse me, a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, Pharaoh chasing them down. Fire comes between them and Pharaoh. Moses holds up his rod, parts the Red Sea. They go across on dry land. Moses and them try to do that, and they drown. 
even after all that, <laughs> when it got time for them to take the promised land, they said, oh, Lord, where's God's office in their sight? In other words, how they felt, they still felt like slaves. They still felt like little people. They still felt like they, they weren't bringing anything to the table. They still had low self-esteem, even after all that. Do you know why? It's because even though God had called them out of slavery, they refused to let God get the slavery out of them. And they carried their low self-esteem with them and got to the edge of the promised land and couldn't go in because they wouldn't believe God. And because that self-esteem was so low, they didn't believe in their God and they didn't believe in themselves. If you read what Joshua and Caleb said, Joshua and Caleb said that we are well able to take it and overcome it. So Joshua and Caleb were full of faith. They believed in their God and they believed in themselves. Okay, so here's the principle one more time. The word of God is not based on feeling, it's based on fact. However, you will never accept the word of God, uh, excuse me, you will never grow in the word of God until you accept it emotionally. So when you look inside of your soul, what is the picture you have? Okay. Now, this is not something that, you know, can be dealt with in a weekend, but it is something that needs to be dealt with. Because when you look inside, the picture that you have of you emotionally, how you feel about you and how you feel about things. Now, of course, nobody's happy all the time. I'm not talking about that, you know, that spooky Christianity where you're in a trance and you have to smile all the time or pretend everything's happy, happy, joy, joy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you can be honest about how you feel, but I mean in here, how do you feel most of the time? And again, how do you see yourself? Because you have to accept what God says mentally and emotionally. Okay? It can't just be words coming out of your mouth. Okay? So let me give you an example of somebody that did this. And then I guess I should give you an example of somebody that didn't. An example of somebody that did this was the Apostle Paul, who was formerly Saul of Tarsus. Okay? When he got saved and he got on the path that Jesus wanted him on, he became Paul, Paul the Apostle. That's the man we know. That's the man that wrote three quarters of the New Testament, uh, if you didn't know that. Yeah, the main writer of the New Testament is Apostle Paul. Well, that guy was actually a professional Christian killer. I kid you not, that's the truth, and I'm not exaggerating that either. What Saul of Tarsus did, he was a Hebrew, he was a Pharisee. He was one of the top Pharisees. He had maxed out on the law. He had mastered everything that his religion had taught him. And he was standing against this new Jesus thing, this new Jesus teaching, this thing where people were walking around talking about uh, that man that was arrested and crucified was actually the son of God in the flesh. And that his kingdom had come and he had been crucified, but he resurrected. And all the things that we believe as New Testament Christians... Well, Saul of Tarsus, before he got converted, was walking around standing against that. And he actually had power from the leaders of his day to arrest Christians that were professing Christians that believed that and drag them off to jail and to get them executed. That's, I'm, again, not an exaggeration, not a joke. Saul of Tarsus was a professional Christian killer. That's what he did for a living. And then he met Jesus. He met the Lord face to face. And the Lord showed him who he was and that he was real. And the Lord told Saul of Tarsus who he really was, which was a chosen vessel unto him. So then Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle. And later on in his ministry, he said this to the Corinthians. Now, Corinthians is a book, it's a, an epistle, that's another word for letter, that Paul wrote to the Christians in the city of Corinth. That's why it's called Corinthians. That's what that means. It's a city, like if somebody wrote a letter to Chicagoans. You understand? So Corinth was the city, and that's why the book's name is Corinthians, and he wrote two letters, and they're long. They're huge in the Bible. First and Second Corinthians are very sizable books. So I'm reading out of Second Corinthians 7, 2. Um, well, let's start with verse 1. Second Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. Therefore, beloved, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles body and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. Now, obviously, Paul was talking about his ministry to the people at Corinth. But how could a man that used to kill Christians for a living, used to drag people into jail and have them executed, how could he ever make a statement to ask people to 
make room for him in their hearts and he hasn't wronged anybody, hasn't corrupted anybody, and he's exploited them. How can he make a statement like that? I'll tell you how. Paul could say that because he accepted that he was a new creature. He accepted that Jesus had really forgiven him for the life that he did before. He accepted it mentally and emotionally. Indeed, Paul was the one that wrote 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a very famous scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay? So, in other words, Apostle Paul lived by that. He accepted that in his mind and his heart. That when he looked inside, he didn't see Saul of Tarsus anymore. Okay? When he looked inside, he saw the Apostle Paul, the one that had been forgiven and washed. And when it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. In the Greek, part of that translation means something that the world has never seen before. So Paul accepted mentally and emotionally that he was not the same person that he was before. You see that? That is so important for us to move forward with God. Because when God tells you who it is that you are and what it is you're supposed to do, you have to see that same picture on the inside or you're going to end up like that first generation of the children of Israel where you're not going to go forward and take the promised land. Because you don't really emotionally believe that you are who God says you are and that you can do what God says you can do and that the Lord is with you and for you. So I will repeat the principle. The word of God is not based on feeling, it's based on fact. But you will never grow until you accept the word of God emotionally. So in other words, the word of God is true, and that's not based on feelings. But it's not going to do you any good until you believe it in here. Not just let it come out your mouth, but you actually believe it in here. Okay? Now that was the principle and the example. Oh, I said I was giving, going to give the example of somebody who didn't get it right. That will be Jacob slash Israel. Jacob was Isaac's son, and he was the one that stole his birthright from his brother Esau. God renamed him Israel because Israel had kings inside of him. He had nations inside of him. And Jacob was the one that was the father of the 12 tribes. So in other words, 12 of Jacob's sons were the, the progenitors of the nation of Israel, the patriarchs. Jacob was their dad. And so the 12 tribes came out of Jacob. So God changed his name to Israel. Well, for the rest of Jacob's life, he never fully accepted that. He went back and forth between Jacob and Israel, all the way up to his deathbed. Even the Bible says when he's getting ready to die, that Jacob was laying on his bed and Israel strengthened himself. So even on his deathbed, he was still vacillating. He still felt like, well, maybe, you know, part of me is still that dude that tricked his brother. And, you know, my name Jacob means supplanter. And, you know, maybe I'm not worthy. He was still on his deathbed going back and forth. And that's why his life was so unstable. That's why his oldest kids were so unstable. He didn't get himself together to way later in his life. And only Joseph and Benjamin really knew his love because he didn't care anything about his older kids. And he let them know that. And, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff happened that didn't need to happen. If he had accepted emotionally that he was Israel, he was the father of kings. Can you see that? So Apostle Paul was somebody that got it right. Jacob slash Israel, somebody that didn't get it right and died before they even fully accepted who they were. Now, that's the principle I wanted to give you on the way to the prophetic word today, okay? So let me tell you what the prophetic word is for today, and then you'll understand why I had to give you that foundation first. The prophetic word for today is, do we really know him? Do we really know God? Do we really know him? Now, I know those of you, uh, some of you watching, those of you watching me live or those of you watching on the replay, I know if you've been in church any length of time, you've discovered all kinds of people in church. When you first come in, into the kingdom, if you are going to church as a child or when you first get saved and you're a babe in Christ, we can be kind of naive and we think that, you know, everybody in church loves the Lord or is living holy or, you know, has your best interest at heart or would never use you. Or, there's a whole bunch of things we think when we first start out and then a little life experience We'll teach you that that's not true. What Jesus said is true is that the tares grow up with the wheat. There's a whole lot of people that look saved and act saved on the surface. But the day will come when the Lord's going to separate <laughs> the tares and the wheat or the wheat and the chaff. But anyway, everybody in church that's smiling don't love the Lord. And everybody that's in church, you know, saying one thing 
ain't living what they saying. Okay? Why? Why? How can people come to the house of the Lord and sit under the word of God and still be mean or still be double-minded or still, uh, how do people do that? Okay? And I just told you why in the opening. People do that because they do not actually believe and accept the word of God mentally and emotionally. They hear it. They do the H part. They hear all the sermons, but they don't do the B part. They don't actually believe it. Because to actually believe what God says about you, again, you must accept it mentally and emotionally. Okay? You, it must be the center of your thought, and it must be the picture that forms in your soul. And, and you can have people come to church for 2, 5, 7, 10, 12, 15, 20, sometimes 25, sometimes 30 years, and they just as mean. I know people like that. Just as mean, or you know people, and you know them for a long time, and they never change. You meet them at one point in your life, like maybe you're a kid when you know them, and you encounter them again as the adult, as, as, when you're an adult, and they're the same person. How can you go to church all that time? How can you hear all that word? I know I'm not the same person I was when I was a kid. I'm not the same person I was five years ago. I'm not the same person I was two years ago. I was just talking to my son the other day, and we were talking about some, some ministry things that we were laughing about, you know, kind of where I was and how we felt at a certain point and where I am now. I know I have changed, and I know that God is the one that changed me, and I give him all the glory, and I take not a drop of credit because it's him. It's his word. It's uh, his grace. He's the author and finisher of my faith, and he's the one that takes me from faith to faith, level to level, and glory to glory. But I know I'm not the same as I was five years ago, not even two years ago. I'm not the same person, okay? But to get there, and there's nothing special about me, because it works the same way for everybody. To get there, you have to actually internalize. You have to mentally and emotionally believe what God says. And that is how you can have people that have all this religion but they don't really know the Lord. They hear it. They hear it just like everybody else hears it. If you go to church and the pastor or the prophet or the apostle or the evangelist or the missionary or the bishop, if they preach, that means everybody hears it. If everybody hears it, how come it doesn't impact everybody the same way? Because some people, the B part, some people just believe it on the surface. They believe it because they want to look like they say it. And some people actually internalize it. Mentally and emotionally. That's the difference. That's the only way you can ever change. You can only ever change if you accept the word of God mentally and emotionally. Okay? So again, our subject is, do we really know him? And I'm going to jump to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Now, the, um, our God sends rather get he also blesses of the nature to receive him. Amen. Amen, Trent York. That's right. It's his grace. That's absolutely right. Now, 1 John was written by the Apostle John. The Apostle John walked with Jesus. He was the one that put his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. He was the one that wrote the Gospel of John. He's the one that wrote uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he's the one that wrote the Book of Revelation. That's the Apostle John. He's also the Apostle that Jesus gave his mother to. So when Jesus was dying on the cross, he said to Mary, Behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. Because Jesus knew he was going away, so he put Mary in the hands of Apostle John. So they were best friends. Apostle John was, was Jesus' best natural earthly friend on earth. And he trusted him with his mom. Okay, That's the guy that's writing. Very important that you understand that. That's the guy that's writing the scripture passage I'm about to read. So we're going to go to 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Wow. There's a, the Word of God is always so action-packed. There's always so much in those verses. But what I want to focus on for this prophetic word is um, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know how much more plain 
Apostle John can state that. This is someone that laid eyes on Jesus on the flesh. This is someone that was the closest person to Christ on earth when he walked to earth as a man. This is a man that was so close to Jesus he could put his head on his chest. They were, you know, bosom buddies. That was literal for them. Okay? This was a man that Jesus trusted his mama to. This was one of the two men that ran to the tomb. That was Peter and John. They were two, because the women saw the empty tomb first. But then when they came back and told the men, Peter and John ran out to the empty grave. And Peter and John were the first two men to see that the Lord's tomb was empty. That's this guy. And he said, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Now, again, I don't know how much more plainly Apostle John could state that. So the prophetic word for today is, do we really know him? I want you to think about your life and think about the way you think about the Lord and think about some of the struggles that you have. Because one trick that the devil loves to do, remember, it's what the devil told Eve. The devil told Eve that God was trying to hold back on her, that if she ate from the forbidden fruit, she would become as God and her eyes would be open. It was going to be a glow up, basically. That there was another level Eve could have walked in that God was holding back from her. But if she sinned and ate the forbidden fruit, she was going to get that glow up. That's what the devil told Eve. Eve bought it and it was a lie. She was already like God. She was already made in the image of God. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that do we really know him? Have we internalized and ingested his word and his love? Do you feel loved by God? Because when you really feel loved by God, you can do anything. Now, by anything, I mean whatever God has assigned you to do. I don't mean you can just pick out. <laughs> it's not a genie concept. You can just pick out whatever you want and alakazam it. That's not what I mean. I mean, whatever it is that God has assigned you to do, you can take the promised land. You can beat the giants if you feel loved by God. And to do that, you have to mentally and emotionally accept his word. But if you don't, then one of the favorite tricks of the devil is to give you so much trouble, to give you so much trial, to give you so much pain, that it makes you start to doubt God's love. And if you start to doubt God's love, then you're not going to do what the Lord says do, because you don't really believe he has your best interest at heart. And that's the game that the devil tries to play with us our entire lives. And that's how you can meet people that have been going to church for decades and they mean. How can you go to church for 30 years and you're mean? You go to church for 30 years and you're mean because you haven't let the love of God get down here. Because when you love the Lord and you know the Lord loves you, you can't keep a bad attitude. It's not possible. You might catch an attitude. Anybody can catch an attitude sometimes. Okay, anybody can lose their temper. The Lord lost his temper sometimes. That doesn't mean you're not seeing people walk around talking about just because you get mad, you ain't saved. No, that's not true. Anybody can catch an attitude. Anybody can lose their temper. Anybody can have a bad day. But I'm talking about over an extended period of time, if you know the Lord, you know his love, you cannot keep a bad attitude. It is not possible when you behold that lovely face. And when you feel that warmth and that glow of his love cascade down into your soul and you realize he didn't die for us, he died for you. He died for me. It's me that he cares about. As a matter of fact, the Lord loves us so much, he loves us as if we were the only one to love. And what that means is that if the world was full of born-again people, if the world was full of Christians, and you were the only sinner, Jesus Christ would have still come to earth through the womb of a woman, incarnated himself, incarnated himself as human, and died on the cross for you so you could be saved. So the world right now is full of about seven and a half, seven point six billion people. If all them people were born again, all them people were Christians, all them people were righteous, and you were the only one that was unsaved and going to hell, the Son of God would still turn himself into a human just to die for you. That's how Jesus loves you, because he didn't die for us. He died for you. He didn't die for us. He died for me. And if I was the only sinner, he would have still died. Now, some of y'all, I know that's the first time in your life you ever heard anybody say anything like that. That's the first time in your life you ever heard anybody say something not personal, which is why so many people that claim the name of Christ just have religion, because they don't really know him. They don't really know his love because you can't know God 
and keep a bad attitude. Of course, you can catch an attitude, like I said, because we're all human. Of course, you can lose your temper because we're all human. But you can't stay there for no 30 years. You can't stay there for no 30 years because his love and his grace is the thing that transforms your very soul. Do you understand? So uh, there's really more. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost if I can come back to this because uh, like uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love chapter, uh, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, love does not boast, it is not proud. Love does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So all of that, you know, I'd have to go over that one by one because that's a whole other mouthful, okay? Uh, so I'll ask the, have to ask the Holy, Holy Ghost if I can come back to that and exegete some of that. But the word for today is, do we really know him? Do you really know him like that? Do you know that he's patient, that he's kind, that he's not envious of you, that he don't want or need nothing you got? Why do we hold stuff back from God? We hold stuff back from God because we're afraid he might tell us something we don't want to hear. We're afraid he might tell us to stop doing something we don't want to stop. Or we're afraid he might tell us to do something that we don't want to do. Okay, but God is not envious of us. He's not looking at me and saying, boy, I sure wish I was like that. <laughs> he don't want, he don't need nothing I got. He's not full of envy. He says what he says because he loves me. And even if it cuts, even if it hurts, even if it means I have to let something go, it has my best interest at heart. But if you don't really believe that, you are not going to obey him. I don't care what you say. Why do you think people end up married to the wrong person? That's always my favorite example. Because you get involved with someone and you don't bother to ask the Lord, is this the right one? And then by the time you do, if Jesus says, no, you done already made up your mind, you're going to marry him anyway. Because you're not willing to let them go. Because you don't really believe that God wants what's best for you. You don't really believe that. You just say that. Okay? And that's always the test. Is, you know, when you're, when you're talking about things that you care about, are you willing to surrender them to the Lord? Because anybody can surrender something to the Lord that they don't care about. That is not a sacrifice. It takes no love or faith to do that. What if you had to sacrifice that which you care about the most? Because I have more than once. There's been times in my life when, man, I was so looking forward to something. And then, and then the Lord told me no. And I just, oh, it was rough. But as time has gone on, I have discovered that that no was in my best interest. That if I had had it my way, if I had gone for what I thought I wanted or what I thought I needed, that would have been not nearly the best life for me and not nearly what it was that God had for me. So he told me no out of love. You see what I mean? So again, the question is, do we really know him? Have you accepted his love mentally and emotionally in here? Is your self-image the same thing he says about you in here? And when something that you care about the most comes up, can you offer it up to God and say, not my will, but thine be done? Because you trust him. Because you know whatever he says to you about that thing actually has your best interest at heart. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that's a lot to deal with. That's a lot to digest, okay? But that's what the Holy Ghost told me to release today. So that's what uh, I'm doing. Okay, so maybe the Spirit of God will let me come back and visit this again because there's a lot more there to unpack. Because we do have to talk about our scars. Because you can talk about loving again. You can talk about loving God or loving another human being or even loving yourself. But sometimes there are scars on your soul. I use this example all the time. This right here, uh, I don't know if you can see it. This is a scar I got from a potato oven in 1985. Okay, it's still right there. Now, obviously, it doesn't hurt because I can touch it. It doesn't hurt, but scar right there, the flesh is still burnt because I got that burn from an oven. Okay, so sometimes we got scars. Now, you know they're healed when you can talk about it, when you can touch it, and there's no pain. But it's still there. It's still on my body. Well, our souls are the same way. And so sometimes the reason we have problems is because there are scars we got to work through and overcome so we can feel loved, okay? So that's a whole, that's a lifetime process and that's something I can talk about in one session. So maybe I'll ask the Holy Ghost again if I can come back. So I don't, I don't want to minimize where you are. I don't want to say you ought to just be able to pop your fingers and accept the love of God because that's not true. That's not true. 
especially if you've got a long way to go, especially if you're coming out of a history of abuse, abuse by others or self-abuse or God help you, religious abuse. You got abused by people in church. A whole lot of us have been through that. And you really got to work through that to learn how to love God and trust him again when the people that abused you were actually the people that claimed to know Jesus, but <clears throat> they treated you badly. Okay? But that's the word for today. Do we really know him? Have we accepted his love mentally and emotionally? Okay? All right. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Uh, when you see me close my eyes and pray in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost if there's another prophetic word, if there's any financial prophetic words, if there's any deliverance needed, cast out demons, and any healing, physical healing that needs to go for it. Okay? Here I go. Okay, not getting anything, so I guess we're clear. That's good. All right, so <clears throat> uh, so I will see you next week at my regular time, uh, two thirty p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't go. I have to show you something because they're here. Don't go. Wait, 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 wait. Coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back. They're here. My daily prophetic devotional. I've been waiting on this a long time. You won't believe what happened. The funny thing happened on the way to Albuquerque. Uh, the wrong zip code was on them, and they got sent back, and I had to reorder them again because I meant to have these in my hand a long time ago because this is, what, January 19th? But anyway, they're here. Okay, and then the daily prophetic devotional is laid out so that you can meditate on the scripture Get prophetic revelation from God, but it's also written journal style so that you can write down the answers and then see the victory that God gives you. Okay, These are available on my website, prophetdavidtaylor.org, so you can get them right now. These are $9.99. I also have a version where there's a blank page behind each page so you can write additional notes or if you just don't want your writing to bleed through on the next page. And those are $12.99 because those books are twice as long and have an additional page. Okay, so I am so excited about this. I'm so excited. I know it's backwards. I haven't figured out a way to not do that. <clears throat> but it says Daily Prophetic Devotional. <clears throat> and I'm so excited about it. I can't make you understand. I've been waiting a long time to get those books. So pick up a copy today. I'm going to be, I may even do an official book launch, but I just want everybody to know I actually have them in my hand. So <clears throat> you can get yours today off my website, prophetdavidtaylor.org. There's also a link underneath this video on the Facebook Live page. And also there's a link on the YouTube page. So wherever you're watching this, go to Facebook or YouTube and look up this video and you can find the links to get your daily prophetic devotional where you can start. And these are going to come out once a quarter. So there's going to be four per year. You know, I'm releasing them all this year. You can buy them anytime because they are multi-year use. Okay. And so the first quarter, January through March is out right now. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And I've been waiting for such a long time. And so I'll probably do a book launch. And then my music. Uh, I'm launching my music and stuff this year. Oh, I can't wait to show you that too. Okay? All right, God bless you. Thanks to those of you that watch me live. Thanks to those of you that are watching the replay. Please like and share this video. Whenever a prophetic word goes forth, then the world needs to hear it. Okay? Please don't keep it to yourself, but share in, 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 in as many places as you know. Because we all need to be challenged by the word of the Holy Ghost. Do we really know the Lord? Do we really know his love? Okay? All right. God bless you. I will see you next week in my regular time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, right here on Facebook Live, Periscope, Twitter, and YouTube. All right? God bless. Have a good week. And remember, he don't love us. He loves you.